Okay, why don't we go ahead and get started. Thank you all very much for coming. Um, so we are going to talk today about LIS program curricula. Um, and specifically, how we go about, I'm going to talk about some of the technical and administrative aspects of updating and revising LIS curricula, and Jill is going to talk from the perspective of a practitioner who's involved in teaching LIS programs as well. So I'm um, Rachel Fleming May, I'm from the University of Tennessee School of Information Sciences. I'm an associate professor and I'm also the director of graduate studies, so I deal with a lot of the kind of unpleasant, I mean some of it's very pleasant, <laughs> administrative stuff um, that has to, having to do with the program. I'm also um, a former practitioner prior to moving into LIS education. I also kind of connected to my work as DGS, but I serve on the Graduate Council of the University of Tennessee, and I was on the Graduate Curriculum Committee for three years. So I'm very intimately acquainted with all of the vagaries of um, curricula at the large public institutional level. So I'm Jill Grog, and I've been with Lyricists, which is um, a consortium of libraries, galleries, archives, and museums for the past four years, and previous to that, I was the Electronic Resources Coordinator at the University of Alabama Libraries for over a decade. Um, and over the course of those 15, 18 years or whatever, um, I have taught at two LIS programs, University of Alabama as well as San Jose State, and have either developed or taught existing uh, five different courses. So that's my background. So we are going to talk about you know, all the aspects of LIS curricula, how it's set, how it's structured, um, what goes into revising it, how you all as practitioners, if that's your interest, can influence LIS curricula. It's very important that we get feedback from people who are working in the field to help us keep our curricula fresh. Um, and then also if you're interested in creating courses yourselves or teaching for LIS programs, um, our practitioner lecturers at uh, University of Tennessee are invaluable to our program. So I want to encourage you all to think about teaching classes of your own if you're interested in all. So we're going to talk about revising um, curricula in LIS or in any discipline really. Why does that happen? In a practitioner focused field like ours it's important that the curriculum stays responsive and actually reflects the work that's being done. Um, when the field changes, the curriculum should change as well. Doesn't always happen, but it should happen. Um, and also, there's sometimes administrative changes at the school or university level or some unit level that necessitate changing curricula also. Um, so when we're talking about revising curricula, there are kind of two main categories for that. You can talk about revising an individual course or group of courses, the content. Or we can talk about revising the program itself and the requirements for the program. That can take a few different forms, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, there's also a difference between revising a course or program and updating it, in my opinion. When I talk about revision, I'm really talking about fundamentally changing the content, whereas updating is just kind of refreshing. That's something that happens all the time. Every time most of us teach a class, we update the content. That's, that should happen just as a matter of course. So at the course level, a um, couple of different approaches to updating the curriculum. Sometimes we'll offer a completely new, brand new course. I was actually just emailing with my director earlier today about courses that we're going to be adding to the curriculum this, this summer and next fall. Um, and then also revising or updating individual courses as well. As far as the program level is concerned, um, most frequently that takes the form of revised requirements for the, for the degree itself. Um, that might be the specific courses that are required for the degree that can change, and that's something we've actually done at UT just within the last year, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Or other types of requirements for the degree. So um, not just the classes that you have to take, but the specific actions or products that you have to create, take or create, in order to finish your degree. So at UT School of Information Sciences, we did all of those things at once. We um, 
revised our requirements for the program, both in terms of courses and in terms of the individual, individual components of the program. Um, we're always adding and revising course content, uh, teaching special topics courses, or just changing the content of the courses that are already on the books. As far as the program revision that we undertook, however, we completely changed our required courses. Um, we have new course titles and new course numbers. We have three courses that are required of all of our students in order to earn the MSIS degree. Um, but we had to completely change them and shift them administratively as well. The graduate school, right around the same time that we decided to do that, and that's something we've been talking about doing for quite a while, the University of Tennessee Graduate School, the Graduate Council, and then finally the Faculty Senate voted to remove the requirement um, that the university used to have for any graduate degree, master's or PhD, that a student would have to complete a comprehensive exam. Um, that was the case for any master's, any doctoral program. Um, when that requirement was removed, individual programs were left to decide if they wanted to continue to require a comprehensive exam or some other kind of deliverable in addition to just completing the courses. We looked at what other programs are doing, their requirements, and uh, probably you know the master's program that I completed did not have a requirement above and beyond courses. Every program handles, not every program, but there are many different models for doing that. Probably some of you in your master's program wrote a thesis or took a comprehensive exam or both, or completed some other kind of deliverable, and some of you probably had a course-only program as well. So there's a lot of variability, and that has um, consequences for recruitment and retention of students as well. So we removed that culminating experience requirement that we had. We used to allow students to complete that we interpreted comprehensive exam as being a comprehensive in-house exam. It was one option. We also had an e-portfolio option that students could create, and that required a live, I'm, I'm saying live because we allowed some students to conduct it via Zoom, that's a, the streaming platform that we use for teaching, um, defense, or writing a thesis, which also required a live defense. Um, that's how we interpreted the graduate school's comprehensive examination requirement. Uh, we decided to remove that requirement. and actually developed a new exit requirement. Um, two of my former students are here and are probably still bitter about this, that they graduated right before we, we made this change. I don't, I wouldn't blame them, I would be bitter too. Um, <laughs> we still had to have some kind of a mechanism for collecting input from students uh, that we could tie to our program outcomes for accreditation purposes. They're very important, both our ALA accreditation, but also we're accredited by SACS as our regional accreditor, Southern Association of Colleges and Schools. As far as the required courses are concerned, we kind of dumped all the content from our three former required courses into a pot and then took pieces out and rearranged them, took some of our course outcomes out and, and put them in a brand new class that I'm creating now and will be teaching next year. Um, and remove some redundancy as well. We had, did have some redundancy between a couple of our required classes and we eliminated that. Uh, we like to think of that as reinforcement more than redundancy, but uh, it was appropriate to remove it. We also have a couple of our faculty uh, felt very strongly for many years that we needed to have a required information technology focused course. So we actually created a brand new course. Much of the content of two of our new required courses are from our old required courses, but the new IT basics class is brand new. So there are pedagogical considerations and then there are administrative administra or considerations when you're making big changes to your curriculum like this. Um, our course revision, we went through a lot of um, kind of background information gathering um, as part of the master's program committee, that there are four faculty members and our student services coordinator. We gathered information about what all of our, um, the, the term that universities like, universities like to use is our aspirational peers. Those are the schools that are ranked higher than we are. 
but um, still our, our peers, but aspirational peers. Um, we gathered information about what all of those schools, the 16 schools that are ranked higher than we are by US News and World Report, require in terms of courses. It's extremely variable. Some schools only require one class. They only have one class. Others require up to six. Um, different numbers of degree credits. Um, different requirements as far as culminating experience or comprehensive exam is concerned. We pulled all of that information together. And it was informative, but we really did discover that there is not one consistent answer about the best um, set of deliverables for a master's program, an ALA accredited master's program. And American Library Association, in addition to, you know, they, they do have standards for accreditation, but they really do leave it up to individual programs to determine how best to help their students meet those standards. Not a whole lot, not a ton of guidance there. Uh, we got feedback from our advisory board. We're for, very fortunate to have an advisory board that's comprised primarily of alums, although we do have some other people from the field who are sort of friends of the school and participate. They come to campus for uh, two days every year, and we did a curriculum workshop with them that was really, really valuable. We pulled, as I just said, we pulled some of our existing content together. Um, so. You might think it would be a, kind of a straightforward process to do all of this. It was really more like this is a road in Ireland, and if any of you have ever been to Ireland and driven there, you know it's not the easiest place to get from one point to another, and that's what this whole process was like for us. Um, it's the kind of thing that you, I mean, just uh, with any big project, there are going to be things that come up along the way that you really can't anticipate until you've done it. Um, considerations for us to make. So for the required courses, we have a lot of students who are part-time students. Some of our students are full-time students, but most of our students are part-time students. Some of them are taking just one class at a time. Um, we couldn't reuse our old required course numbers because we needed to have some overlap to allow our students who had started under the old set of required courses finish. So we had to create entirely new course numbers for our three new required courses. Um, we also had to make sure that all of our students who started under the three required courses prior to fall 2019 were able to finish. We weren't going to offer those classes in perpetuity. We had one semester of overlap and had to get everybody through. Everybody who had started those classes maybe just taking one class at a time. And we actually did have a couple people who somehow slip through the cracks and we're having to make other arrangements for them. Um, so that was uh, particularly challenging. The graduate school, and this is pretty standard I think, has a policy that you can't reuse course numbers within five years, so you're going to have to consider that. Um, as far as the course content is concerned, we did want to make sure that our students who were completing the old set of required courses didn't feel like they were getting, you know, had, had been kind of shortchanged in that, you know, well, this is kind of old, dusty, crusty content that you guys felt like it was okay for us and every, the new students are getting all this new, shiny content. Um, not the case. A lot of what we are teaching in our new set of required classes, like I said, are, it's kind of reformatted from our former required classes. It's also a major consideration of faculty effort. It takes a lot of time and work to develop a brand new class. Um, typically when we do that, it's, it's as part of our regular workload. This was above and beyond, and luckily my director is incredibly uh, flexible and um, recognizes the need for uh, recognition of, of faculty effort and, and was able to make arrangements for that. So something that I, when I talk about the administrative process of updating the curriculum, um, there is a whole world outside of the school that I was not aware of prior to um, working in this capacity as Director of Graduate Studies, but also serving on the Graduate Curriculum Committee. Um, I, you know, used to wonder why it took so long for things to get updated or changed, and I had no idea why that was. So I wanted to just share a little bit of that with you. So this little smiley face, that's me with my idea to update our curriculum. So when a faculty member wants to, let's say, create a new class 
and assign a course number for it that will be included in the catalog. That proposal would go to the Director of Graduate Studies of the school. In our case, and I'll just talk about it from our departmental perspective, it's similar throughout the university, but I'll just talk about us. Um, I bring that to the master's program committee when the, after the proposal comes to me. If the master's program committee thinks that it's a good idea, we'll take it to the school faculty for a vote. If the school faculty passes that new course and they, they, they like the name of the course, they like the description, we think the number is going to work, um, it goes on to our college's associate dean for academics. She takes it to the college's graduate study committee for a vote. If the graduate studies committee passes it, it goes on to the faculty of the college, the, the whole college um, of communication and information faculty. If they pass it, then it finally moves out of the college and gets to the university graduate school level. So the ADA, the associate dean, then takes it to the graduate school. The graduate curriculum committee votes on it. Then the graduate council votes on it. Then the faculty senate votes on it. And then it is accepted by the graduate school for the catalog if it passes all of those things. This process, as you can understand, I'm sure, just from my describing, it takes a really long time. At any point, there are going to be revisions. Faculty, even if they don't know anything about the topic, will give you suggestions for, you know, this is what I think the, the title should be, this is what the description should be, wordsmithing. That, so it's a um, very labor and time intensive process. So if you are thinking about creating a new course and maybe still interested, what are some things to think about? So if you have an idea for a new course, you know, you think, when I was getting my master's, they didn't teach X, Y, or Z. I wonder why not. Um, first of all, to, to kind of start thinking about if you have an idea, really spending some time with yourself articulating what that topic means to you and, and if it really um, if there's enough content there to really constitute an entire graduate level course. Um, I am a big believer in using the resources that are available to us and not reinventing the wheel. Are other programs teaching a course or offering a course that's similar to the course that you are considering? Is there a syllabus that you can use as a model? Is there someone at another school who's teaching a course like that that you could maybe talk to? Um, is that topic covered in other courses? And Jill's going to talk a little bit more about this, but it's very difficult to determine from a syllabus what all that is covered in a specific course. Um, just from looking at a syllabus, you might think that, oh, they're not talking about scholarly communication or uh, digital humanities or whatever, unless you, I mean, that's why people take courses, right? That you get the content of the course as you take it. So. Um, just trying to get a sense of how well the co topic is covered in other courses. Just practical considerations, thinking about the format of the course. Um, LIS education is now very largely online. Many, pro not every program, but many, many, many of the 50-some accredited LIS programs in the U.S. and Canada have a distance program. That opens things up for instructors as well. We have a large number of lecturers, very few of whom live in the Knoxville area. Most of them live in other parts of the country. Um, but some people still do prefer to teach in person, and that may be a possibility for you, depending. Um, if you're going to teach an online course, do you want to teach in a synchronous program or an asynchronous program? Um, I think we sometimes assume that distance education means asynchronous. But a lot of LIS programs, master's programs, are synchronous. So that everybody logs in for class at the same time, and you use a streaming platform um, to deliver the content. Some people prefer one. Some people prefer the other. Which program would you maybe con contact or reach out to um, to offer your course? If you already have an existing relationship with an LIS program, maybe uh, one that you are a, an alum of, or you know faculty at an LIS program, that might be a good place to start. Do they already offer the course that you're thinking about, or would it be something that would make sense for them to include? Um, what, it, what requirements do they have for instructors? Some LIS programs, because it is a master's level education, require that all of their instructors have the master's plus 18 hours of graduate credit. Some of them are fine with just 
the master's degree. Some of them want the <laughs> instructor to have a doctorate, um, especially for specific courses. That's highly variable and you're not going to know until you ask. So approaching the school, what should you do if you think that you know what you want to teach? Get in touch with the director or dean. It's just send them an email and let them know. You know, maybe send a copy of your CV um, and ask them if, if they would consider it. Do you need a syllabus? Do you need to send a syllabus along with your CV? No, usually not. If you have an idea for a course, you can just kind of send a summary. Um, it's helpful to talk about how that course connects with other courses that the program is offering. Um, it's also always helpful to tie the content of your course to the program outcomes that that particular degree program has. This course will fit in with the courses that you already offer or the skills that you um, prioritize for your students because outcomes three, four, and five uh, are directly related. If the course doesn't work for the first school that you approach, take it somewhere, you can take it somewhere else. You're, I mean, you're not limited uh, anymore to a school that's in your direct geographic area you may be able to offer that course elsewhere. So now Jill is going to talk about a specific example developing a scholarly communications course. Yeah, so I'm going to take what Rachel just talked about kind of theoretically or conceptually and what I'm in the process of doing right now, which is um, looking at how to create a scholarly communications course. So I'm thinking about, you know, I love to teach. What, I, what do I want to do next? Do I want to redo something I've already taught or propose something new? And scholarly communications, obviously, is something that is all around this conference as well as other conferences. It reaches lots of different areas of librarianship. It's really become almost a core competency for both the generalists, those of us who are not doing it. My title, for example, when I was at the University of Alabama was e-resources librarian, but I certainly needed to have general knowledge of scholarly communications, as well as those people who are actively employed and entitled as open access librarians, scholarly communications librarians. So this is what I approach. And so just really briefly, I mentioned this before. So in the past, I've taught five courses over two different programs, both in-person, online, synchronous, and asynchronous. The very first course I ever taught and developed was, was this lady right here. Me too. Like 15, it yeah, it's a long time ago. We were 15. Yes. <laughs> um, it, was a, it was a brand new course for adult library user instruction. There were school library media specialist courses, but there wasn't one that specifically focused on, for example, adult education at public libraries or in academic libraries. It was a new course and it was an elective. And the process that Rachel just described um, is for an actual course to get assigned a number in the catalog. However, most of my experience has been teaching new courses under something at the University of Alabama. It's called LS590, Issues in Librarianship. So it's kind of a catch-all that you can test out new courses. This library user instruction, out of all of these that were new, is the only one that actually went through all that process and now has its own number. So there are those that you just try out. Electronic resource management, I taught that one um, twice, I believe, um, oh, and that's been about seven or eight years ago, really talking in greater detail about link resolvers and all that kind of stuff. Academic Libraries was an existing course that had its own course number, taught that. Licensing, which specifically focused on, you know, the components of copyright and licensing, that was an elective. And I just most recently taught research methods, and that was an existing course, and at the time it was a core level course. So a lot of experience they're creating both new classes, testing them out, some of them worked better than others, and, and I really enjoy this process. So, what is scholarly communication? So this is the active part of the presentation over the next 15 minutes or so. Would someone like to offer their definition of scholarly communication? I'll just sit here awkwardly until someone talks. Isn't it in your title? Well, <laughs> Uh, is it the, the methods of getting research from the actual 
researchers into the hands of people who want to use it. I don't know. That's, yeah, that's good. So I'll read. Just. <laughs> 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 right. We've got like maybe a C plus. Um, so ARL, uh, the system through which research and other scholarly writings are created, evaluated for quality, disseminated to the scholarly community, and preserved for future use includes both formal means of communication, such as publication, etc. Other definitions are very similar in that way. So, uh, this is an ongoing iterative process, and for full disclosure, Rachel said, uh, with whom do you have a relationship at the current library school? My husband teaches at the University of Alabama Library School, and we're in the process of proposing this course together. The previous courses were all me, or I co-taught with Rachel, so, um, but we're in the process of doing this together, so I do have a little bit of inside uh, knowledge there about how this particular program functions. But there does seem to be a need here for a scholarly communications course, and so when I originally envisioned this, I'm bringing my background to it. So this is me at the very beginning. I look up scholarly communication, I find the ARL definitions, and then I think, what do I think of as scholarly communications? I immediately think of the academic publishing ecosystem from beginning to end, which is described there in that ARL definition. Obviously, issues of copyright and licensing are involved. Um, electronic resource management, again, because that's my background, both the acquisition of materials within the library as well as the delivery of those materials to our users, our faculty members, mostly I'm um, in academics. Um, obviously, uh, as you can see from this particular conference, as many others right now, issues of open access and how that's going to disrupt the more traditional academic publishing ecosystem, as well as just generally the economics of publishing. I think this is something that librarians and every different job I've had, it shows me or I begin to understand a new aspect of the economics of publishing and the whole process of it. And I don't think that that's something that's necessarily addressed right now, at least overtly in library school. It certainly wasn't when I was there. I didn't under, I mean, I knew what peer review was, but I didn't understand the whole process and it wasn't exactly articulated. So this is what I thought of with scholarly communications. So what um, we're doing right now is we've already evaluated the requ required courses at the University of Alabama. The University of Alabama School of Library and Information Studies recently went through a very similar thing, and I think this is probably on trend for library schools in general. They're evaluating their required core classes. For example, it previously was depending on when you all perhaps went to library school, it was what we would always call, although they had different names, you know, reference, collection development, cataloging, um, research methods, et cetera. There were five requir required courses. As of fall 2019, they've gone through a similar process that I was not as deeply involved in at all. I just heard about it at all. Was um, that Rachel and her school went through where they now have three core classes information and media, information and communities, and professional paths. And um, you can, I won't go through the, the tedious process of reading the course descriptions there, but that's part of the process of evaluating the required classes and where those topics I had identified are covered within there. That's a really important process. The other thing is to evaluate the current electives that are available. There, there still is a collection development class, so where are publishing economy or electronic resources management, are they covered in there? Um, information sources in the humanities, social sciences and sciences, publishing ecosystems can differ pretty significantly depending on the discipline, so they may be addressed in those. Um, differences between academic special medical libraries because how those may address uh, issues of scholarly communication. Certain research methods, digital libraries, and as I mentioned, issues in librarianship, which is that catch-all course where you can propose these new types of courses. So that was our first round through. Then we went out and began to evaluate whether or not there were core competencies that had been articulated by professional societies 
<coughs> excuse me, professional organizations or other types of entities that had identified what does it mean to be a scholarly communications librarian. If you're a specialist in scholarly communications, what skills and concepts and um, knowledge do you have? And there are two out there that I was not familiar with. It's NASIG, which is the North American, well, it previously stood for the North American Serials Interest Group. Now I think it's just NASIG, kind of like OCLC, it's just OCLC now. Um, they have um, core competencies, excuse me, I've got a tickle on for um, <clears throat> scholarly communications librarians that were adopted in August of 2017, so that's pretty recent. And then the um, Confederation of Open Access Repositories also have some core competencies that are available out there that were adopted and published in June of 2016. So what I'm doing at this point, basically, is I'm taking what I'm bringing to scholarly communications with my background, which was that original brainstormed list of academic publishing ecosystem, copyright and licensing, and overlaying it or comparing it to those core competencies that are out there and determining where the overlap is and what I was missing. And so I want to go through some of what I was missing. One large piece of it that falls under the umbrella of open access is institutional repository management. That's a huge piece of what a lot of scholarly communication librarians do. So obviously that falls underneath open access management, but institutional repository management in and of itself has um, elements of project management, it's information technology management, are there skills there that need to be addressed in this course? There's an element of education and advocacy, which are communication skills that need to be um, talked about and how you go about building relationships across campus. Some of the other core competencies that I had not necessarily thought about when bringing my background to it are data management services. Is that something that the scholarly communication librarian is going to be responsible for? Does that fall underneath the umbrella of this course? Another area is assessment and impact metrics. Is that something that needs to be addressed in the scholarly communications course? Or, I know at Rachel's um, library school, they actually have an assessment course that is specifically focused on that. So maybe it's something that's touched on in this particular course, but not specifically addressed in the great detail that it would be. Um, so all of that is important in the second iteration of this. Then you go through the process of reevaluating the current courses that are out there. And that's where we are at this point. So again, another area that would fall perhaps underneath open access, although it depends on how you might set up within a particular library. Lots of libraries are now getting into the business of being publishers. So library publishing services, their systems and metadata, does that need to be covered in this scholarly communications course? Managing, again, an institutional repository, that project management and information technologies, are those things that need to be addressed in this course? And are they addressed elsewhere? There is actually at the University of Alabama an elective in project management. So that's something that you could point someone to, or does it, how in depth do I need to cover it if I'm proposing this particular course? Then you go through the process that Rachel described, which is assessing the current landscape and we're in process of doing this, which is looking at other library schools and seeing what kind of courses are being taught there. We've identified two so far, the University of Illinois, which is going to be obviously one of those aspirational peers, because they're, they're, they're number one, right? Are Washington, Illinois, UNC all kind of... Right, okay. So we're looking at aspirationally, obviously, um, and they have a course, Issues in Scholarly Communication. North Carolina, interestingly enough, has one that isn't a full three credit course, but 1.5 credits. So that's not something that I had possibly considered. And I don't even know if that's a possibility at Alabama within their curriculum or not, but it's something to consider. And it's not just looking at the course description or even the syllabus, and we're not there yet, but it's the process of reaching out perhaps to the people who teach these courses, both internally and externally, because it's 
critical, certainly internally, that we're talking to the people that are teaching those other courses at Alabama who may have components and see how they're addressing them, obviously, as well as reaching out to whoever's teaching issues and scholarly communications at Illinois and just have a conversation. Ask if they're willing to share their syllabus. Sometimes they are, sometimes they aren't, but at least making the effort to reach out and determine what else is out there. Certainly, when I was creating the licensing course, I went through this process as well um, to determine what else had been out there. Another thing that's available out there is um, Library Juice, which is a training, if you're familiar with that. They have a scholarly communications course. And those are often taught by practitioners. So, you know, reaching out there to determine what's available, what you can collaborate on, what they're willing to share, just in, that, in terms of reaching out in that way. The other thing that I think is really important is to scan, and this is because I'm approaching this as a practitioner, is to scan the job listings for those, those positions that are out there right now. Um, and I left a question mark there because I don't know. This is another thing that's in process. Uh, those positions that have the title Open Access Librarian, what skills and um, other types of knowledge are they looking for when they're hiring that position? Uh, scholarly communications, perhaps, ele perhaps electronic resources. One thing as I was going through this process that really struck me is I became an electronic resources librarian in 2003. That wasn't even my, the name of my position. It was Serials Librarian at that point. But it, and, and ultimately, the Electronic Resources Librarian position became this kitchen sink position. You know, anything that had electronic resources. And then over the years, it has become diffused throughout many positions in the library. And I see some parallels with scholarly communications right now with that. So that's been interesting in terms of, of looking at this process. So some preliminary conclusions that we come that I've come to, and again, this is an iterative process. We're looking at proposing this for next fall. You have to plan ahead. I had hoped to do it for the spring, but we're now looking at next fall. Um, one course cannot serve them all. Again, the emergence of electronic resources librarians, and you can't possibly address all of this. So we've got to determine how we want our shaped within the context of the current curriculum at the University of Alabama, and then the broader context of what scholarly communication means in the field of librarianship right now. Um, education, education and advocacy, as I've read through all of my materials about scholarly communications librarians, the core competencies, is a critical role here. And we just had a discussion in a previous session I was at about how you go about learning those types of soft skills like good communication and good relationship building and that's something that I, I think I really want to address in this course. How do you go about and build those relationships across campus as well as external to the university? And then finally, as always in library school, we're trying to strike a balance between perhaps some technical knowledge as well as just the conceptual knowledge. And we're almost out of time, but I would really, you know, if you all have thoughts about the types of topics and skills that should be covered in such um, a scholarly communications course, you can email me, um, at, you know, how useful are those kinds of core competencies that our professional associations send out. And, you know, always this discussion about library school, it's the balancing of the technical skills versus conceptually what we mean in terms of scholarly communications. And any questions that you all have now about getting involved in LIS education or LIS education generally? Or? Yes. Um, my name is Tony Zanders. I'm with Boston University. Hey. Um, there was a slide where you had a diagram that talked about the different steps to get a course approved. There was like 10 steps or something. At any one of those levels of approval, are employers ever involved? Employers, people who hire librarians coming from um, this program. Prior to that, that was just administrative within the university. The the steps to just get a course in the catalog, right? Basically, um, we do talk to employers quite a bit. We have a you know an alumni and employer survey. We survey uh, people that supervise our practicum students. Mm -hmm. um, we consult a lot of material, a lot of the process that Jill's talking about. Uh, we take 
all of that kind of information into account when we're creating a course. And that would certainly be part of the justification. I mean, part of this, if we're not just saying, hey, graduate school, we want to approve this course. You have to write a long justification for these courses. And that kind of information does go in the justification for a new course, a new description. I'm just trying to reconcile this gap. It seems to be the gap between what employers are looking for and what graduate students are yeah. able, capable of doing when they graduate. Yes. And I'm wondering if that sort of multi-step, multi-year potentially approval process mm -hmm. had anything to do with Um, It can definitely slow it down. I mean, it can, the trick is to keep, what's being approved is not the, like the syllabus so much. Got it. It's the name of the course, the number, uh, and we're limited to you know certain numbers that we can choose from, and a very brief catalog description. And the trick is to kind of keep the catalog description as general as you can, um, so that you can so you're not locked into teaching like a specific LMS, for example. Um, because then if you, if you you have to go through that process over. I mean, you have to go through that whole process even if you just want to say. I'm not going to require this specific mm -hmm. prerequisite anymore. Got it. It's just to get a change in the catalog. Um, so ideally, you would keep your description brief and general enough that you're continuing that process of shaping the content and you're not locked into teaching specific things in the course. That makes sense. I think we're one minute over, but go ahead. Do you want me to ask you afterwards so everyone else can leave? Uh, why don't we do that? So if we have other questions, and again, any feedback you have on the scholarly, specifically for me anyway, the scholarly communications, this, I've just corrected this, I'm jill.grog at lyricist.org. Please feel free to send to me because I, we're in the process right now, and very much I appreciate any thoughts you might have about that. And I would also just like to say, that it's extremely important for practitioners to remain engaged with LIS education. Whether that's as an instructor, which is tremendously valuable, but also, you know, if it's the school that you, from which you graduated, that's great. If it's a school in your geographic area, that's wonderful too. Those of us with a more practitioner-oriented focus in teaching, um, I don't know what Bob's going to say about this, but, um, <laughs> We need practitioners to continue to tell our colleagues and administrators what practitioners need to know. Okay. I'll make one quick comment. I yes. wrote a column for Against the Grain that said there is no theory of collection development. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, well, take a look at that, yeah. So. Well, thank you all very much. Thank you for